Today, in a world filled with darkness and despair, there is hope through faith in Jesus Christ. Stay tuned for the next half hour to experience the life-changing power of God. Now, here is Sam Luke. If you go to the book of Acts, chapter 2, beginning verse 1, reads like this, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. That was, of course, the inaugural outpouring. So you have this symbol of the Holy Spirit. A sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind filled all the house where they were, they were sitting. And there appeared to them cloven tongues like as a fire. Fire is an emblem of the Holy Spirit. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance or the ability. It is the will of God for every believer to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you go back to the Old Testament, Isaiah 28 and 11, Isaiah said, For with stammering lips and with another tongue shall I speak to this people. This is the rest wherewith the weary are calls to rest. This is the refreshing. One of the interesting things about the Pentecostal blessing in Acts 2 is that when they got so excited praising God in an ecstatic utterance they had never learned. They spilled out of the upper room into the streets of Jerusalem where hundreds of thousands of happy celebrants had gathered to observe the Jewish holidays. And they heard them each in his own language speaking the wonderful works of God. And they remarked, these men are drunk. Now the word there is not intoxicated. It is euphoric. And in other words, they said it would appear from listening to them, they are without a care. And many, many years before Christ was even born in Bethlehem's manger, the old evangelical prophet said there's coming a time when people will receive rest from the Lord and they will be refreshed and renewed. For with stammering lips and with another tongue shall I speak to this people. This is the rest wherewith the weary are caused to rest. This is the refreshing. When Peter was talking about a Holy Ghost outpouring, he called it times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Never underestimate what the Holy Spirit can do in your life to give to you a wonderful sense of emotional well-being. In Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27 a new heart also will I give you, the Bible says. A new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I'll give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. In Numbers 11th chapter, there's a fascinating story about how God realized that Moses was struggling under the weight of the responsibility of caring for the children of Israel. He instructed him to appoint 70 elders and to bring them together into the tabernacle, the house of God, and he would give to them the same anointing that Moses had. So God poured his spirit out on these 70 elders and me, dad, and Eldad. Everybody say me, dad, and Eldad. Are there any two people here who just happen to be named me, dad, and Eldad? Raise your hands, please. I didn't think so. Who are they? They were nobody. They were insignificant. But guess what happened? Me, dad, and Eldad happened to be walking by the door of the tabernacle while God was pouring his spirit out on the 70 elders, and they caught some of the overflow. Me, dad, and Eldad went through the camp of Israel prophesying. Thus says the Lord. They were prophesying. And when Joshua heard about it, he rushed to Moses and said, Moses, you've got to stop this fanaticism. Me, dad, and El dad have the Holy Ghost. They're out there prophesying. I believe Moses just laughed and in Numbers eleven twenty nine, 29, he said, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. 
Isaiah said that in the last days God will pour his spirit out as water upon the thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. In the book of Joel, Joel said that God will pour out of his spirit. And I believe that what happened on the day of Pentecost was a fulfillment of this ancient promise. But I have good news for you. Today in 2020, you and I can receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. God wants to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Can somebody say amen? amen. And so this morning, I'm really excited about talking to you about this wonderful infilling of the Holy Spirit. I want to talk to you about the promise of the Holy Spirit. I want to talk to you about the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to talk to you about the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised the Holy Spirit. In John the 14th chapter, he said uh, in, in verse 12, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do. Now let me qualify that. You can't do anything greater than raising the dead. You can't do anything greater than Jesus did. He's not talking about that. He's talking about scope. Jesus lived in a country of fourth the size of Illinois and never traveled over 200 miles from his home in any direction. So what he's saying is there will come a day when there will be millions and millions of believers doing the works that I've done. And that's what he meant when he said greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father and whatsoever you shall ask in my name that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name I will do it if you love me. Keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not neither knoweth him but ye know him. Now watch for he dwelleth with you and he shall be in you. How many of you know you cannot be saved without the Holy Spirit? Jesus said in John 3, you must be born again. And he explained to Nicodemus, this is how you're born again. You are born of the Holy Spirit. So when you say, Lord, give me the Holy Spirit, I think that you are misspeaking. And I don't believe you're doing it intentionally, but I want to explain something to you. You don't get more of the Holy Spirit when you're baptized. The Holy Spirit gets more of you. And that's what it's about. It's about a relationship. Now, Jesus promised that we could have this relationship with the Holy Spirit. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. There are 6,000 promises in the Bible. To my knowledge, this is the only time Jesus ever referred to any promise as the promise of the Father. It must be important. He said, you see, the promise of the Father. For John truly baptized with water, which is outward and cold and negative. But ye shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. Ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire, which is outward and glowing and positive. And so he's saying there's coming a day when you will enjoy a relationship with the Holy Spirit that you don't have right now, even though you're born again. Now watch this. Jesus appeared after his resurrection and breathed on his disciples. And what did he say? Receive ye the Holy Ghost. But nobody was baptized in the Holy Ghost. And yet Jesus said, receive the Holy Ghost. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, you know me and you know the Father. I came from the Father. The Father and I are one. If there's one thing you've learned from walking with me these three and a half years and, and, and from watching me and listening to my sermons and, and my teaching, you know that the Father and I are one. I reveal the Father. The Father's revealed the Son. But you do not know the Holy Spirit. Sadly, many people today do not know the Holy Spirit. They refer to the Holy Spirit as an influence that radiates or emanates from God. They talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. We speak of the Holy Spirit in the uh, sense that uh, we want it. Oh, I want it. And I know that many times we're talking about the blessing. We're talking about the experience. But the Holy Spirit is a person. And Jesus was simply saying to them, before you can be filled with the Holy Spirit, you must recognize that the Holy Spirit is God, that the the Holy Spirit is a person. Now receive him. He basically was introducing them to the Holy Spirit. And so this morning, if you'll open your heart to him and say, Holy Spirit, I need you as my comforter. I need you as my guide. I need you every day of my life, 24-7. Come in. 
in and take control and take charge in my life. Amen. And he'll do it. See, some people today don't understand what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They think that uh, we're talking about some kind of uh, a fanatical uh, gibberish and something that's, uh, uh, you know, borders on being cultish. And, 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 and that's always been a problem because the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, when you speak with other tongues, it is supernatural, number one, in its origin and in its operation. But it doesn't mean that it's not an experiential doctrine that is soundly anchored in biblical revelation. This is not something that just happened at the turn of the last century. This is not just something that people today are claiming to have as some kind of a supernatural experience uh, that, that is, uh, is not really outlined in Scripture. What I'm talking about is a spiritual experience that has a biblical precedent. If you go to the book of Acts, the Bible said they were filled and they spoke as the Spirit gave them the ability. There are many signs that your spirit filled. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faithfulness. There are many signs that you're walking in the Holy Spirit. But listen to me. The initial outward physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives the ability. But don't seek the tongues. Seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit and the tongues will come. Amen. Does that make sense to you? I said, does it make any sense? I, I want to make sense up here, okay? So listen carefully now what, what I'm talking about. This is a promise that Jesus made. That Jesus made. I didn't make it. Jesus said it. Jesus said, you can have the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16, verse 7 and 8. It's expedient for you that I go, which means it's, to, it's best for you. It's to your advantage. Can you imagine how the disciples must have felt when Jesus said that? You're leaving us? How can that be best for us? He said, it's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come uh, unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, what does that mean? When Jesus was on the earth, he had 12 disciples, but he had three that were members of the inner circle. Not everybody could touch Jesus. Not everybody could get to Jesus. Not everybody that wanted to get to Jesus was able to get to Jesus. We read about people that had to press through the crowd and reach out and touch the hem of his garment. They couldn't have a conversation with him. Sometimes they just saw him at a distance. But let me tell you, through the Holy Spirit, oh, blessed be God, Jesus is real to you and you and you and you and you and me and and he's real all the time. Hallelujah. That's why it says that he doesn't speak of himself. It doesn't mean that he's not equal in glory and importance and significance to the Father and to the Son. It simply means that his office work in this world is to make the presence of Jesus Christ real to your heart. Hallelujah. And no man can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. When Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? They said, well, some people say you're John the Baptist raised from the dead or one of the other prophets. He said, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said, thou art the Christ, the, the son of the living God. Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father in heaven. How did he do that? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. This morning when I woke up, I woke up singing, he is Lord, he's risen from the dead, and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every time I whisper the name of Jesus, it's the Holy Spirit that makes his presence real to me. Oh, hallelujah. I'm so glad I have been filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Jesus promised that we would receive the Holy Spirit. Being assembled together with him, Acts chapter 1, verse 4, he commanded them. Everybody say commanded. He didn't suggest it. He commanded them to tarry in Jerusalem until they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Number two, I want to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit just a little bit. Everything Jesus did, he did in the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 10, 38 tells us how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. In the fourth chapter of the book of Luke, verse 1, and Jesus 
being full of the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, and he returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. Verse 18, Jesus stands up in the synagogue and reads from the book of Isaiah. He says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel, to heal the sick, and to set the captives free. That's the anointing. That's the power of God, and God has given it to us today. Hallelujah. I don't know about you. Somebody asked me the other day, said, you need the Holy Ghost to go to heaven. I said, son, I need the Holy Ghost to go to Walmart. Amen. I need God's power in my life. I can't make it. God equips me. The, the infilling of the Holy Spirit equips me to live for Christ. It equips me to, to live for for Jesus Christ. So there's this power, there's this promise, and now I want you to understand that you and I can be thoroughly equipped to do the works of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. My personality does not produce on its own the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now some of you are more pleasing than others to deal with. You know that. How many of you know that there's some people that just seem to be happy all the time? And they, they smile. Of course, some of them are in an institution, but I'm talking about the ones that are out walking around on the street. They seem to be more pleasant, right? They said there was a guy that went to one of those institutions, and he's standing by the gate, and a fellow comes up in the car, and his car got a, a, a flat. So he's watching him. And the man takes the tire off, takes the lug nuts, puts them in the hubcap, puts the other tire on there, and before he can put the lug nuts back on him, he picks up the, the hubcap, and all the lug nuts fall into the, uh, the gutter. And he's standing there scratching his head, and the man in the asylum says, Hey, buddy, why don't you go and take one from the other wheels and put it on that one, and then you can get to uh, a service station somewhere, and you can, uh, you'll be all right. You can get down the road. The guy looked at him, he said, my goodness. He said, I thought all you people in there were crazy. He said, we are, but we ain't stupid. <laughs> there is a difference. But some people you talk to, they're very pleasant. They're smiling. they got a pleasant personality. Maybe they got a better disposition. You know what? That's just the way God made them. Some people are kind of, uh, uh, how can I explain, irascible. And, and there, somebody said, like, like me? Did you say that? Is that what you said? Oh, you said mean. I thought you said like me. But, but uh, you, you understand what I'm trying to tell you? But on your own, by yourself, you're not able to produce love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, and faithfulness. Some of the people that I know that try to do that are frustrated. But let me tell you something. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it just comes out. I mean, that's, you just can't help it. That's just who you are. Come on, somebody. And you produce the fruit of the Spirit. And by producing the fruit of the Spirit, you are a blessing to somebody else. And not only that, you become effective in what you do. How many of you have tried to do something and you be honest and you looked at it and said, boy, that was ineffective. I really didn't do a good job. Come on, say amen. You know what I'm talking about. But listen to this. Paul said in Ephesians 3 and 20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Sound like an overachiever. Exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. How? According to the power that worketh in us. 2 Corinthians 9, God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul said, my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Hallelujah. So everything we do, we got to do it in the power of God. You can't grow a church just on uh, the, these principles of growth you read in somebody's book or an article in Charisma magazine. It's not one size fits all anyway. Some people go to symposiums and seminars and these conferences on church growth and they come back all excited, jazzed up. Man, we're going to grow the church. And they try to do things on their own, their own way or the way somebody else did it. And it's a colossal failure. You really want to see church growth? You do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, 3,000 souls were saved, baptized in water, joined the church. Acts chapter 4, the number of men saved was 5,000. Acts chapter 6, the uh, Bible said believers were the more added to the Lord. Multitudes, both of men and 
and women. Acts chapter, uh, or, uh, chapter 5, chapter 6 says the number of disciples multiplied. Everybody say multiplied. Multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. You want to see our church multiply? Then begin to operate and to flow in the anointing of the Holy Spirit and watch what God will do. Amen. Amen. So there, there's, this, there's this promise, there's this power, and now I want to talk to you about this purpose, and, and I'll be very brief, hopefully. Uh, and, and so I want to, I'll just go ahead and tell you right up front, there are three things I want to talk about. The first purpose is to equip us to live for him. The second purpose would be to uh, give us a foretaste of our inheritance or the future. And then the third purpose is to simply uh, quicken our mortal bodies at the coming of the Lord. So how many of you are going to stay with me another, another five, ten Minutes. Anybody five, ten? Can I get somebody to stay with me five or ten minutes? Anybody 15? 15, 15, 15, 15, got a 20? I have 20, 20, 25, 20. I got a 30. Forget it. I'm not going to go that long. Just, I just need you to don't get through before I do, okay? Turn, turn to somebody and say, I promise I won't get through before he does. Okay. So I want to talk to you about what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe that God wants us to reveal the very nature of Christ to people through the Holy Spirit. When people see you, I want them to see Jesus in you. I want them to, when we pray for folks around here, I want you to feel Jesus in my touch. I want you to hear Jesus in my voice. The things I do, sometimes we do acts of kindness and we, we, we have uh, the wrong motivation. Well, I want to do it because you'll like me. Everybody will like me. Nobody ever liked me. I want people to like me. Guy went to a psychiatrist, said, I don't have any friends. Nobody likes me. He said, you got to help me, you big, fat, ugly jerk. And I don't know why some people don't have any friends, but they don't have any. And that uh, seems like a personal problem. But if you start doing good things, hoping somebody's going to like you, it won't really work. But you know what? When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you can't help but feed the hungry. You can't care, help but care for the needy. You can't help but do good things. In fact, you'll find more good things than you ever thought you could do because the Holy Spirit just keeps birthing ministries and says, do do this for me and do that for me and be my hands and be my feet and speak for me and love for me. Hallelujah. That's what the spirit-filled life really is all about. Somebody say amen. I'm going to try to hurry. All right, I want to talk to you about the second purpose. I don't know about you, but what motivates me in life, keeps me going, is that I know that where I'm going is better than where I've been. Amen. How many of you believe there's a heaven? All right, let's try that one more time. How many of you believe there's a heaven? Say amen. amen. I want you to turn to somebody, look at them, say neighbor. Amen. There's a heaven. Amen. Now, we know there's a hell too, right? But we know there's a heaven. As a child of God, you're on your way to heaven. Listen, Jesus said in John 10, 28, I give unto you. You can put your name in there. I give unto you, Sandy, eternal life, and you shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck you out of my hand. You don't have to stay up at night worrying about going to hell. You're not going to go to hell. You're a child of God. Right? And you need to focus on that. The reason that we're warned about hell is so that we can win others and keep them from going to hell. But you don't need to wring your hands and pace the floor. Oh, am I going to go to hell? I don't know if I'm going to go to hell or not. I don't want to go to hell. Are you washed in the blood? Is the blood enough to keep you? I said, is the blood enough to keep? The Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. I may not have dotted every I and crossed every T, but I'm as clean and pure as the blood of Jesus can make me. I'll tell you that right now. And, I, and somebody said, well, I, I know there are things that are wrong. That's why Jesus said the Holy Spirit will reprove you of sin. Nobody has a, a, a sin sensitivity like the, the Spirit-filled child of God. When God reveals something to you, ask Him to forgive you and continue to walk in unbroken fellowship with God. It doesn't mean that you continually, habitually make a practice of sin, but it does mean that when God puts His finger on something in your life and He makes you aware of something, that's when you need to repent, give it to God, get it under the blood, and keep walking. Come on, somebody. Why? We're going to heaven, that's why. I don't know about you, but I want to go there. Anybody want to go? Yeah. Hallelujah. John 14, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. See, the thing that will keep you from being, having a uh, heart trouble is to believe what Jesus said. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there." ye may be also. I love living here. I love living with you, but this ain't heaven. How many of you know this ain't heaven? 
It ain't hell, but it ain't heaven either. Come on, somebody. Somebody say, well, I hate this place. Well, you need to move. Amen. <laughs> Just move. I hear people go on Facebook, I hate America. Well, move. Go back where you came from then. Amen. We'll get an offer together and help you go. If you don't love a place, you'll never be a blessing to a place. If I don't love Richmond, I'll never bless Richmond. If I don't love Midlothian, I'll never bless Midlothian. If I don't love Victory Tabernacle, I'll never be a blessing to Victory Tabernacle. You don't bless and help and encourage anything you don't love. I love my wife. Happy birthday, honey. 25 again. Glory to God. I love my wife. Amen. I want everybody to know I love my wife. And yes, Doreen, I know I don't deserve her. Thank you very much. I know that. But I love her just the same. Hallelujah. So I want to bless her. I want to encourage her. I want to do things that will help her to grow, help her to move forward in, in the Lord. So what I'm trying to tell you this morning is that you've got to love heaven to get there. We are citizens of another country. I love heaven. I love to stand, pledge allegiance to the United States of America. I love to do that because I love my country. But there's another country I love. It's called heaven. And Jesus said, I've gone to, oh, I'm preaching better than you letting on. He said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. And it won't be long till it comes back to take us home. Woo, what's this place going to be like? Let me tell you something I, I read. It's a place where every step is a thrill. Every moment is a jubilee. Every home is a mansion. Every person is holy because the Bible said, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. The Lamb's book of life serves as the city director. It's a city that has streets without sickness or disease, no hospitals, no rest homes, no sadness or sorrow. God will take out his great big handkerchief of love and wipe all the tears from our eyes. It's a city that has no sickness. It is a city that has walls of jasper, gates of pearl, 12 foundations made of precious stones, streets of transparent gold. It has sunless days and moonless nights because Jesus is the light of that city. I'm breaking into the message right now to pray the prayer of faith. Would you believe God with me as I pray? Heavenly Father, pray this prayer with me. Come on. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Please have mercy on me. Forgive me for all of my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for dying in my place on Calvary's cross so that I could have eternal life. And now I am who you say I am. I am a child of God. And I have what you say I have. I have eternal life. Thank you, Father. For hearing my prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Praise the Lord. I believe God heard my prayer. And uh, you know, there's a way for you to reach back and tell me about what God's done in your life. All you need to do is go to victorytab.org. That's victorytab.org. I'd really like to hear from you and know about what God did in your life. And I want to know how I can help you on your Christian journey. Thank you so much. May God bless you and, you know, until we're together again, just like this, around the Word of God, I want to remind you that the Bible says this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith.